Section thirteen of nineteen sixteen first chapters collection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Nineteen sixteen first chapters collection by various. Section thirteen. The Brook Careth, a Syrian story by George Moore it was at the end of a summer evening long after his usual bedtime that joseph sitting on his grandmother's knee heard her tell that kish having lost his asses sent saul his son to seek them in the land of the benjamites and the land of cilicia whither they might have strayed but they were not in these lands son she continued nor in zulp whither saul went afterwards and being then tired out with looking for them he said to the servant we shall do well to forget the asses lest my father should ask what has become of us but the servant being of a mind that kish would not care to see them without the asses said to young saul let us go up into yon city for a great seer lives there and he will be able to put us in the right way to come upon the asses but we have little in our wallet to recompense him saul answered only half a loaf and a little wine at the end of the bottle we have more than that the servant replied and opening his hand he showed a quarter of a shekel of silver to saul who said he will take that in payment whereupon they walked into arimathea casting their eyes about for somebody to direct them to the seer's house and seeing some maidens at the well come to draw water they asked them if the seer had been in the city that day and were answered that he had been seen and would offer sacrifice that morning as had been announced he must be on his way now to the high rock one of the maidens cried after them and they pressed through the people till none was in front of them but an old man walking alone likewise in the direction of the rock and overtaking him they asked if he could point out the seer's house to them to which he answered sharply i am the seer and fell at once to gazing on saul as if he saw in him the one that had been revealed to him for you see son seers have foresight and the seer had been warned overnight that the lord would send a young man to him so the moment he saw saul he knew him to be the one the lord had promised and he said thou art he whom the lord has promised to send me for anointment but more than that i cannot tell thee being on my way to offer sacrifice but afterwards we will eat together and all that has been revealed to me i will tell you understand me son the old woman crooned the lord had been with samuel before times and had promised to send the king of israel to him for anointment and the moment he laid eyes on saul he knew him to be the king and that was why he asked him to eat with him after sacrifice yes granny i understand but did the lord set the asses astray that saul might follow them and come to samuel to be made a king i dare say there was something like that at the bottom of it the old woman answered and continued her story till her knees ached under the boy's weight the child's asleep she said and on the instant he awoke crying no granny i wasn't asleep i heard all you said and would like to be a prophet a prophet joseph and to anoint a king but there are no more prophets or kings in israel and now joseph my little prophet tis bedtime and past it come i didn't say i wanted to anoint kings he answered and refused to go to bed though manifestly he could hardly keep awake i'll wait up for father now what can the child want his father for at this hour she muttered as she went about the room not guessing that he was angry and resentful that her words had wounded him deeply and that he was asking himself in his corner if she thought him too stupid to be a prophet i'll tell thee no more stories she said to him but he answered that he did not want to hear her stories and betwixt feelings of anger and shame his head drooped and he slept in his chair till the door opened and his father's footsteps crossed the threshold now he said to himself granny will tell father that i said i'd like to be a prophet and feigning sleep he listened 
determined to hear the worst that could be said of him but they did not speak about him but of the barrels of salt fish that were to go to beth shemis on the morrow which was their usual talk so he slipped from his chair and bade his father good night a resentful good night it was and his good night to his grandmother was still more resentful but she found an excuse for his rudeness saying that his head was full of sleep a remark that annoyed him considerably and sent him upstairs wishing that women would not talk about things they did not understand i'll ask father in the morning why granny laughed at me for saying i'd like to be a prophet but as morning seemed still a long way ahead he tried to find a reason but could find no better one than that prophets were usually old men but i shall be old in time to come and have a beard father has a beard and they can't tell that i won't have a beard and a white one too so why should they his senses were numbing and he must have fallen asleep soon after for when he awoke it seemed to him that he had been asleep a long time several hours at least so many things had happened or seemed to have happened but as he recovered his mind all the dream happenings melted away and he could remember only his mother she had been dead four years but in his dream she looked as she had always looked and had scolded granny for laughing at him he tried to remember what else she had said but her words faded out of his mind and he fell asleep again in this second sleep an old man rose up by his bedside and told him that he was the prophet samuel who though he had been dead a thousand years had heard him say he would like to be a prophet but shall i be a prophet joseph asked and as samuel did not answer he cried out as loudly as he could shall i shall i what ails thee son he heard his grandmother calling to him and he answered an old man an old man ye are dreaming she mumbled between sleeping and waking go to sleep like a good boy and don't dream any more i will granny and don't be getting up the bedclothes don't want settling i am well tucked in he pleaded and fell asleep praying that granny had not heard him ask samuel if he would be a prophet a memory of his dream of samuel came upon him while she dressed him and he hoped she had forgotten all about it but his father mentioned at breakfast that he had been awakened by cries it was joseph crying out in his dream dan disturbed thee last night such cries shall i shall i and when i asked what ails thee the only answer i got was an old man dan joseph's father wondered why joseph should seem so disheartened and why he should murmur so perfunctorily that he could not remember his dream but if he had forgotten it why trouble him further if we are to forget anything it were well that we should choose our dreams at which piece of incredulity his mother shook her head being firm in the belief that there was much sense in dreams and that they could be interpreted to the advantage of everybody dan said if that be so let him tell thee his dream but joseph hung his head and pushed his plate away and seeing him so morose they left him to his sulks and fell to talking of dreams that had come true joseph had never heard them speak of anything so interesting before and though he suspected that they were making fun of him he could not do else than listen till becoming convinced suddenly that they were talking in good earnest without intention of fooling him he began to regret that he had said he had forgotten his dream and rapped out he was the prophet samuel now what are you saying joseph his father asked joseph would not say any more but it pleased him to observe that neither his father nor his granny laughed at his admission and seeing how interested they were in his dream he said if you want to know all samuel said he had heard me say that i'd like to be a prophet that was why he came back from the dead but father is it true that we are his descendants he said that i was a most extraordinary dream his father answered for it has always been held in the family that we are descended from him do you really mean joseph that the old man you saw in your dream told you he was samuel and that you were his descendant how should i have known if he hadn't told me joseph looked from one to the other and wondered why they had kept the secret of his ancestor from him 
You laughed at me yesterday, Granny, when I said I'd like to be a prophet. Now what do you say? Answer me that. And he continued to look from one to the other for an answer, but neither had the wit to find an answer. So amazed were they at the news that the prophet Samuel had visited Joseph in a dream, and satisfied at the impression he had made, and a little frightened by their silence, Joseph stole out of the room, leaving his parents to place whatever interpretation they pleased on his dream. Nor did he care whether they believed he had spoken the truth, he was more concerned with himself than with them, and conscious that something of great importance had happened to him. He ascended the stairs, pausing at every step, uncertain if he should return to ask for the whole of the story of Saul's anointment. It seemed to him to lack courtesy to return to the room in which he had seen the prophet till he knew these things, but he could not return to ask questions. Later he would learn what had happened to Samuel and Saul, and he entered the room, henceforth to him a sacred room, and stood looking through it, having all the circumstances of his dream well in mind. He was lying on his left side, when Samuel had risen up before him, and it was there, upon that spot, in that space, he had seen Samuel. His ancestor had seemed to fade away from the waist downwards, but his face was extraordinarily clear in the darkness, and Joseph tried to recall it but he could only remember it as a face that a spirit might wear for it was not made up of flesh but of some glowing matter or stuff such as glow-worms are made of nor could he call it ugly or beautiful for it was not of this world he had drawn the bedclothes over his head but impelled he knew not why for he was nearly dead with fright he had poked his head out to see if the face was still there the lips did not move, but he had heard a voice. The tones were not like any he heard before, but he had listened to them all the same, and if he had not lost his wits again in an excess of fear, he would have put questions to Samuel. He would have put questions if his tongue had not been tied back somewhere in the roof of his mouth. But the next time he would not be frightened and pull the bedclothes over his head and convinced of his own courage he lay night after night thinking of all the great things he would ask the old man and of the benefit he would derive from his teaching but samuel did not appear again perhaps because the nights were so dark joseph was told the moon would become full again but sleep closed his eyes when he should have been waking and in the morning he was full of fear that perhaps samuel had come and gone away disappointed at not finding him awake but that could not be for if the prophet had come, he would have awakened him, as he had done before. His ancestor had not come again, a reasonable thing to suppose, for when the dead return to the earth, they do so with much pain and difficulty, and if the living whom they come to instruct cannot keep their eyes open, the poor dead wander back and do not try to come between their descendants and their fate again. But I will keep awake, he said, and resorted to all sorts of devices, keeping up a repetition of a little phrase, he will come to-night when the moon is full, and lying with one leg hanging out of bed, and these proving unavailing, he strewed his bed with crumbs, but no ancestor appeared, and little by little he relinquished hope of ever being able to summon Samuel to his bedside, and accepted as an explanation of his persistent absence that Samuel had performed his duty by coming once to visit him, and would not come again unless some new necessity should arise. It was then that the conviction began to mount into his brain that he must learn all that his grandmother could tell him about Saul and David, and learning from her that they had been a great trouble to Samuel, he resolved never to allow a thought into his mind that the prophet would deem unworthy. To become worthy of his ancestor was now his aim, and when he heard that Samuel was the author of two sacred books, it seemed to him that his education had been neglected, for he had not yet been taught to read. Another step in his advancement was the discovery that the language his father, his granny, and himself spoke was not the language spoken by Samuel, and every day he pressed his grandmother to tell him why the Jews had lost their language in Babylon, till he exhausted the old woman's knowledge, and she said, Well now, son, if you want to hear any more about Babylon, you must 
ask your father, for I have told you all I know. And Joseph waited eagerly for his father to come home and plagued him to tell him a story. But after a long day spent in the counting-house, his father was often too tired to take him on his knee and instruct him, for Joseph's curiosity was unceasing and very often wearisome. Now, Joseph, his father said, you will learn more about these things when you are older. And why not now, he asked. And his grandmother answered that it was change of air that he wanted and not books and they began to speak of the fierce summer that had taken the health out of all of them and of how necessary it was for a child of that age to be sent up to the hills dan looked into his son's face and rachel seemed to be right a thin wan little face that the air of the hills will brighten he said and he began at once to make arrangements for joseph's departure for a hill village saying that the pastoral life of the hills would take his mind off samuel hebrew and babylon rachel was doubtful if the shepherds would absorb joseph's mind as completely as his father thought she hoped however that they would as soon as he hears the sound of the pipe his father answered a prophecy this was for while joseph was resting after the fatigue of the journey he was awakened suddenly by a sound he had never heard before and one that interested him strangely his nurse told him that the sound he was hearing was a shepherd's pipe the shepherd plays and the flock follows she said and when may i see the flock coming home with the shepherd he asked to-morrow evening she answered and the time seemed to him to loiter so eager was he to see the flocks returning and to watch the she-goat milked and in the spring as his strength came back he followed the shepherds and heard from them many stories of wolves and dogs and from a shepherd lad whom he had chosen as a companion he acquired knowledge of the plumage and the cries and the habits of birds and whither he was to seek their nests it had become his ambition to possess all the wild birds eggs one that was easily satisfied till he came to the egg of the cuckoo which he sought in vain hearing of it often now here now there till at last he and the shepherd lad ventured into a dangerous country in search of it and remained there till news of their absence reached magdala and dan set out in great alarm with an armed escort to recover his son he was very angry when he came upon him but the trouble he had been put to and the ransom he had had to pay were very soon forgotten so great was his pleasure at the strong healthy boy he brought back with him and whose first question to rachel was are there cuckoos and magdala father doesn't know his grandmother could not tell him but she was willing to make inquiries but before any news of the egg had been gotten the hope to possess it seemed to have drifted out of joseph's mind and to seem even a little foolish when he looked into his box for many of his eggshells had been broken on the journey see granny he said but on second thoughts he refused to show his chipped possessions but thou wast once as eager to learn hebrew his grandmother said and the chance words spoken as she left the room awakened his suspended interests as soon as she returned she was beset by questions and the same evening his father had to promise that the best scribe in galilee should be engaged to teach him a discussion began between dan and rachel as to the most notable and trustworthy and it was followed by joseph so eagerly that they could not help laughing the questions he put to them regarding the different accomplishments of the scribes were very minute and the phrase but this one is a greek scholar stirred his curiosity why should he be denied me because he knows greek he asked and his father could only answer that no one can learn two languages at the same time but if he knows two languages joseph insisted i cannot tell thee more his father answered than that the scribe i have chosen is a great hebrew scholar he was no doubt a great scholar but he was not the man that joseph wished for thin and tall and of gentle appearance and demeanour he did not stir up a flame for work in joseph who as soon as the novelty of learning hebrew had worn off began to hide himself in the garden his father caught him one day sitting in a convenient bough 
looking down upon his preceptor fairly asleep on a bench and after this adventure he began to make a mocking stock of his preceptor inventing all kinds of cruelties and his truancy became so constant that his father was forced to choose another this time a younger man was chosen but he succeeded this joseph not very much better than the first after the second there came a third and when joseph began to complain of his ignorance his father said well joseph you said you wanted to learn hebrew and you have shown no application and three of the most learned scribes in galilee have been called in to teach you joseph felt the reproof bitterly but he did not know how to answer his father and he was grateful to his grandmother for her answer joseph isn't an idle boy dan but his nature is such that he cannot learn from a man he doesn't like why don't ye give him azariah as an instructor has he been speaking to thee about azariah dan asked maybe she said and dan's face clouded end of chapter thirteen the brook careth a syrian story chapter one by george moore